Dr. George Sparks. I'm an archaeologist for uh, Bible Interact, and today we got a very special program. An old friend of mine, um, Major Paul Hesse, retired, and what we're going to be talking about today is something that we actually did years and years ago for God's Learning Channel, and that's some major archaeological finds that were actually made by PhDs. No, but these were actually made by, by kids, yeah. of all things. I think it's very important if you go to a, an excavation, have some kids around. For some, they're, they're, they're lucky. They might be annoying a little bit, but for some reason, these are major finds that go back over 100 years that are in the Israel Museum, you know? And oh, yeah. uh, this, this is going to be fun. Uh, Paul, if you would, I'm calling you Paul. Um, if you would, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit your, about your, your background and also your, your academic background. So let's start off with, with, uh, with when we met, and then I'll work backwards and forwards. So uh, uh, you and I met in Albuquerque back in 2003. You had moved uh, to Albuquerque uh, to uh, be part of the Museum of Archaeology and Biblical History. Uh, I was ending my Air Force career. So I was ending a 20-year stint uh, in the Air Force. And so what got me to 2003 was uh, I had uh, been in ROTC uh, at the University of Cincinnati, which is where I got my bachelor's degree. And then after I entered the Air Force, I, uh, I got an advanced degree in, in uh, chemistry. During my various uh, positions and assignments in the Air Force, I had been a researcher. I had uh, been a professor of chemistry at the Air Force Academy. Okay. And so what brought me to Albuquerque was I started a stint doing flying experiments for the Air Force and all of the Department of Defense in space. Okay. So I was doing space uh, when we met. Okay. But I was ending my career at that time. I'd been in 20 years. Uh, so it's kind of odd that I would have this interest uh, in archaeology and history of this nature. Uh, but I am a history buff, so uh, it, it just fascinated me. And before we met in 2003, I had gotten uh, connected with the Museum of Archaeology and Biblical History in Albuquerque, and I was asked to be one of their docents. So I, I trained to understand the archaeology and the artifacts and how to present them, okay? And so I had already been giving presentations and talks uh, to various groups when you and I met in 2003, okay? And then from there, uh, we just had a blast. I mean, we, I mean, I remember <laughs> driving out to Midland, Texas to do the God's Learning Channel uh, TV show. And then we got a chance, or I got a chance with to go with you. You'd already been to Israel, but I got a chance to go with you and a whole group of people from uh, all, all over the United States uh, to go to Israel uh, and uh, go to these archaeological sites under the auspices of the museum and uh, Trinity at the time. And uh, that, that was an incredible experience to, to be in the land, okay, because you had all, okay, I don't know if you remember this. You had already introduced me uh, to Bargell Pixner, and he wrote those books. Uh, and nice. his and and his statement was uh, everything according to the fifth gospel, and he believed that the land was the fifth gospel, and that that truly was had an impact on me. So when we're in there, and I don't know if you remember this, but we were supposed to be hanging with the group. And we never did because you knew all this other stuff that was around and we would always run off and go to a different section of the tell or different section. And, yeah. and, be, and then all of a sudden we're having to catch up with the rest of the group. But again, it was, it was a blast, very educational. Uh, and so when I finally left Albuquerque, uh, I retired in 2003 from the air force, I stayed on in a civilian position, but then I, left the Department of Defense uh, entirely in 2005 and came back to Ohio. Uh, and in the process of that, I had gathered uh, and purchased from uh, the uh, museum uh, some artifacts that uh, were representative of the things that we would use in the presentations. 
And I was able, and I still have those, and I use those in presentations and classes to all types of groups and also in Bible classes or classes that I teach uh, at my local congregation. Okay. And so that's how we're connected. And, and I, I came, you know, like I said, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not an expert. Uh, but I've been taught enough, probably to be dangerous, but, but, to, but to, uh, to give uh, some oomph uh, with these artifacts uh, to connect people with the biblical narrative. Uh, and it is a tremendous way to teach. And, uh, and I have to thank you and all the other people that helped me uh, do that. Uh, your, your collection itself is quite extensive. It always blows me away. Right now, I'm kind of looking at the thing behind you, and I'm like, yeah. Wow. Well, did you that, see there's the, a uh, lot of really thing. cool stuff back there. I don't there. know if I, I can, can already see. So, there's a little oh. sarcophagus back there. Oh, my goodness. See, now, wait a minute. See, now, you think, okay, what do you say? Huh? <laughs> Is there a resemblance here or what? You know, because we will talk about a little bit about King Tut when we get there. But Right. Now, you know, your beard isn't quite right. Well, you know, some Egyptians have that fake beard, but see, I got it going on. I got real right, bald head it. and a real okay. beard. So, I mean, it's been 13, 14 years. And I said, you know, I got to get back in touch with Major Paul Hesse. But uh, because I just remember he was really good at speaking. And uh, and that's why I invited you, because you, you're, you, you knew how to relay the message quite well. We're talking about, <laughs> okay, um, the major discoveries. Of, of children. Paul, get, get us rolling on this, would you please? Okay, so the first the first thing we're going to talk about is the Siloam inscription, uh, which was discovered uh, at the um, Siloam pool end of Hezekiah's tunnel. And uh, Hezekiah's tunnel, of course, was discovered uh, by um, uh, Edward Robinson back in like the 1830s. And it had been dug out by him and everybody, and it was and it's associated with those passages in in the Old Testament that talk about how Hezekiah diverted the Gihon Spring uh, in order to protect the water source because of the impending attack from uh, Assyrians, yeah. and it's a water channel, so it fills with water. In 1880, there was a young, it was a 16 year old kid, okay, by the name of uh, Jacob. Uh, Eliyahu, and he he did what sixteen year old kids do all the time. He skipped school to go swimming, and he was he was so he entered from the uh, from the uh, Siloam pool end of Hezekiah's tunnel, and he was floating. This is this is eighteen eighty, so you don't have you know lights. So he was floating a candle on top of the water, and he was swimming up the channel towards the Gihon Spring. And as he's going, he's feeling along and he realizes that, you know, that this is like, this is work. This is like chiseled out. And so he's feeling along, he feels the ridges. <clears throat> well, after a while, you got to turn back and come, come home. Uh, so he turns around and he's, and he's, and now he's probably just floating back because that's the direction the water flows. And as he's going along and he's feeling along the wall, he comes apart, a, across a section of the wall that is actually smooth. It's slightly carved out and it's smooth. It's not like any of the other stuff. And as he's fumbling around and he looks at it, he it, it looks to him like there's something written on it. Okay, so what he does is that he, after he exits and uh, probably gets uh, in trouble for skipping school, uh, he tells his headmaster and this headmaster went in, waited in there and was and was uh, inspecting this inscription and he was able to determine that this was something written in Hebrew. And so he actually was the one that started the investigation of what this actually was. Right. Well, sadly, in the meantime, you know, a looter comes in. You can't keep anything secret. Looter comes in, chisels it out, and uh, breaks it breaks up a, a couple of pieces off of it. Fortunately, uh, you know, he was discovered, and they were able to recover all the pieces. And now it sits in the Istanbul Museum, right. and it's one of the earliest uh, inscriptions that we have in what is known as Paleo-Hebrew, which is the Hebrew right. of the uh, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries, okay, so that it would have been consistent with Hezekiah's time. 
Right. Uh, so that, that's how it was found, um, was by a 16-year-old kid who skipped school to go swimming. Kids will be saying, well, I skipped school because there's a chance that I can make a, a wonderful discovery today. Now, this would be this inscription, and, of course, uh, that was found in what we call Hezekiah's Tunnel during the Assyrian siege, which was Sennacherib's siege. Um, dates to the latter part of the 8th century. So we're looking at like 720, something around there. Uh, and it is uh, one of the oldest inscriptions. Do you have the translation at all? It says the tunnel. That's the tunnel they were in. And this mm -hmm. is the story of the tunnel. While the axes were against each other and while three cubits were left to cut, the voice of one man called to his counterpart. Uh, and on the day of the tunnel being finished, the stone cutters struck each man towards his counterpart axe against axe, and flowed water from the source to the pool for 1,200 cubits. And 100 cubits was the height of the ceiling, is what they mean, over the head of the stone cutters. Based on what that inscription says, is that these guys were cutting, they, they were cutting the tunnel towards each other at opposite ends, and they met in the middle, which is pretty astounding uh, is. if you think about it. Uh, and that was that was an inscription that told about when they actually met, and uh, and and it's not like Hezekiah's tunnel is a straight shot from one from the Gihon Spring to the Solomon Pool. It it meanders all under the old city of David. So so that was that alone is quite a feat for the eighth uh, century BC. That that's pretty amazing. And they're bringing the water in because of the Syrian siege. And they didn't want their water source where the Assyrians could take it. And virtually, they would, you know, like go thirsty, starve to death. So it's very important to bring that water source in. And quite a ways, too. It's not just a couple feet in. It's way into the city. When we read the biblical text in the Christian faith, if I can say that, uh, we take the shortcut. You know, give it all to God. God, I'm praying for this to happen. You make it happen. Right? But when we look at Hezekiah, not only does he confront the God of Israel, but he also does something. And he does quite a bit because we also find what we call lamella candles, which were like story jars with the king's stamp, you know, probably collecting taxes, building up the military force. And we find those in a number of larger tell sites. And, uh, if you go to Jerusalem, you can see what we call the broad wall. We extended the wall, made it, you know, to defend the city. It's called the broad wall. And, um, of course, and then it actually mentions in the biblical text that they built this water channel. Mm -hmm. And this is actual. If you want to say something, what does archaeology have that proves the Bible? This is a major find. And this is a bit of history in the scriptures mm -hmm. that is borne out clearly by the archaeology that we find and you, you can argue it but there it is right there so that particular time in history for israel and uh and and just the physical stuff that they did in order to prepare for what they thought was going to be a very long siege exactly, uh, yeah. tr truly amazing truly amazing what they put together and and that was under the leadership of Ezekiah. So right. you can't you can't deny you can't deny the history you can't deny the politics you can't deny the angst you can't deny the preparation you know so if if you if you want to put a human face on this you know you you have to think well what would we do if we knew that something like this was coming well, we would prepare for it and and that's exactly that's exactly what they did back then so. Right. Uh, it's a great, it's a great story. And again, found by 16 year old kids skipping school. In the biblical I text, used... It's kind of neat too, because it says that the Syrians were laying siege to Jerusalem. People mm -hmm. are defending the city, but they're up on the wall and Sennacherib sends a messenger out. He's speaking in Hebrew. So everybody can hear it in their own tongue and basically mm -hmm. says, now, if you come down now, there's a euphemism. Everybody will be under their own fig tree by noon. You know, that means everybody <laughs> will be happy and at peace. But if you don't come down, right. let me tell you what else we got planned. You'll be eating your own dung and drinking your own urine. Right. Now, 
then Hezekiah basically sends the word out that says, don't reply, don't say anything. I mean, there's a lot to this story that's that's pretty cool, you know? Yeah. And well, in the well, face of what could be a lot of suffering, you know, mm-hmm. uh, he did what he could and mm-hmm. uh, to avoid the siege. And as the epic goes in the biblical narrative, of course, uh, Sennacherib is called back home because there's a coup going on at his hometown, and he has to take care of that. And we have evidence of that in the Sennacherib prison. So we got the a prism is like a cuneiform cylinder. So we've got evidence for not only for what happened in Jerusalem with the tunnel, but back home in Nineveh with mm-hmm. Sennacherib. So yeah. we could talk. We can connect those two. Okay, yeah. next one. You want me to tackle that? That's King Tut. Yeah, yeah, sure. Why don't you? Yeah, because you, you know, way with a sarcophagus in the background, I think you're you probably yeah. have the edge on each. Hey, and I, I, that's you know, that's why you know, I got the hat too, man. I got the whole ensemble going on here, you know what I mean? There we go. So now, you know, some people think that you know, King Tut's tomb was was pristine, but actually, there was some pilferging, pilferging people stealing. In the ancient world, and ar- as archaeologists were uh, excavating in the Valley of the Kings, they were finding cups and jars and pieces of linen with the name Tutankhamun on it. So Howard Carter was saying, "We still got a tomb here," and they went looking for this tomb. But of course, he needed financial helping. So what happened? He he uh, actually around 1917, Howard Carter. I'll just call him Carter. Uh, got in touch with a, a wealthy landowner, a British landowner, whose name was Lord Carnarvon. And, and they started searching in the Valley of the Kings. And they did it very systematically, and very time-consuming and expensive because they formed a grid. And in that grid, they had the little like boxes in a grid, if I can, that makes sense. And they did every little box in that grid from 1917, and then they had some, there was a World War I, uh, so there were some time periods where they couldn't excavate, but between 1917 and 1922, they were busy looking for King Tut's tomb, one square after another square after another square, and they were going down to the bedrock, so we're talking about probably hundreds of laborers, workers out there in, in, the, in that heat, trying to find this, this tomb. So this went on for so long that finally, this is today's money, $18 million, looking for something and finding nothing. I mean, yeah, nothing. <laughs> That's painful. That's yeah. painful, you know? And uh, so it got to the, uh, a time where Lord Carnarvon, he was the one that was the, the piggy bank. Uh, he said, hey, listen, you know, the, we, we got to put an end to this. He says, I can't keep on affording flipping the bill. And Howard Carter Convinced him just one more. They're down to one square. That's it. One square out of this big grid that they made of all these other squares, one after another, all these years, they're down to this one. And Carter convinced Lord Carnarvon just one more season, just one more. Three days after starting this search, just three days in, a young boy. Now, they're actually looking, they're actually looking for a boy's tomb. King Tut was what, 16, 17, 18 when he died? Yeah. That's kind of interesting. So you got a boy. I'm not going to give it away yet. A young boy was trying to stabilize an amphora. An amphora is a storing jar. I'm going to turn my camera real quick here and see if I can. There's one right there. Can you see it? Mm. Oh, nice. Let's go this way. There you go. Now, I can't show you the bottom of it, but it tapers down so that they can dig out a section of the sand, right? And it's got to go down deep enough where that amphora can stand upright and they fill it with water and they can use a dipper jug lid or what have you to to get the water out of it. Now, this is a representing amphora. It's not from the correct time period, all right? So in placing the water into the ground, the boy came across a flat level pavement in the foundation. And it beveled down at a 90-degree angle, which doesn't happen naturally. 
So he runs to Howard Carter. He goes, Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter. So it's like, what? He's got to see this. He's got to see this. He's dragging him. Come on, Mr. Carter. Come on, come on. And they look, and this is the, you know, they can see the top of a step. He goes down a little bit further, and you can say another step, and it goes down another 90 degrees. And Carter says, hmm, looks down at the boy, and he goes, where do you think this goes? And the little boy looks back up, and he says, oh, down. <laughs> so they keep on digging, and they finally find the entryway. It was a plaster doorway with the actual seal on it. You know, there's lots of pictures of this, of Tutankhamun's hieroglyph, his name, his cartouche, if you will. Howard Carter spent nearly 10 more years removing this. You take all, next day they empty the tomb, get all that stuff out of there, the gold, the silver, and 10 years removing 5,000 items from the tomb. That's pretty extensive. And of course, because of that, you know, it became very popular. It's even popular today. It's one of the most <laughs> fantastic discoveries well over now 100 years, about 100 years, 22, and we're at 23, 100 years, right? But I bet you didn't know this. I'm going to give you like, I bet you didn't know this. <laughs> See how I smile. A light bulb goes on, eh, epiphany. President Herbert Hoover even named one of his dogs after King Tut. <laughs> here, Tut, here, Tut, he brings back a bone. I wonder where he got that. <laughs> The biggest excavation ever within, I'll say, 100 years. One of the biggest excavations was actually found by a boy who was stabilizing a large amphora for the team that was excavating in the Valley of the Kings for Howard Carter, financed by Lord Carnarvon. That's cool. But yep. cool continues. All right. Since Carter was very wealthy and he financed this whole thing. Also, he sold the printing rights, the publishing rights to the Times of England. I believe that's called the Times of England. Nobody else could have it. First goes to the Times of England. And you called me earlier, and I was trying to find these newspapers, and I was kind of like, oh, I'll find it later on when I'm not looking for it. That's how it goes, right? You know, I, do, I got a 12-year-old son. I should send the kid out. He'll find it. This should be a lesson to me, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I got just my answer right here. What am I around. doing? Send yeah. my kid out. He's out, out of school. Yeah, and just have yeah, have him skip school and then drag well, him they're out of school. Him. Yeah, and you know, there you go. He'll find it. There you go. So anyway, so uh, <laughs> when Carter was uh, gifted certain objects uh, to friends from the tomb, there were certain arrangements that were made that were not clear yet. So it isn't that he's looting his tomb. That's the way it would look. But it it could be that he had to pay people kind of like for favors. Sometimes that happens in events, you know, business. I don't know. But he gifted objects from the tomb to a friend. Now get this. Now the friend, after he takes that item that he got from Carter, from King Tut's tomb, places it in his house, his house burns down. Okay, so they go back and they rebuild his house. After they rebuilt it, a flood came and destroyed the house. Some say this was punishment for taking something out of the tomb. See how this goes? Oh, okay. Yeah. The curse. The curse. The curse. Now, even though there's a curse and Carter took it out and gave it to his friend, his friend's house is being destroyed. Carter still lives for another 17 years. You know? How's your house doing? Because remember, you know, like... You got some items from me. I can see your background. Is that your house or is that the new house? <laughs> it continues because later on, Howard Carter was, they went into the tomb when they opened that, uh, the door, if you will, and they broke through uh, with a chisel. He has a, Howard Carter has a little candle. And remember, Lord Carnarvon says, boy, what do you see? And Carter says, wonderful things. Remember that? That's his big statement. I see wonderful things. Later on, they were not supposed to go back into the tomb, except with through the Egyptian authorities. But they couldn't take it. So they went in, they snuck in, and they chiseled out part of a wall, and they went in to investigate another chamber. All right? It's probably during one of these times that 
Lord Carnarvon, who really didn't have great health to begin with, uh, was bitten by a mosquito or something. Mm. All right. It healed over, but then when he was shaving, he opened it with his razor. It got infected, and he passed away. This mm. starts, you know, the, the rumor of what? King Tut's curse. And from that, Hollywood just took off. And we have the mummy. The mummy returns. The mummy's mummies will, will return. Death of the mummy. The mummy's back alive again. The mummy's right behind you. Look out. Here comes the mummy again. You know? And, and this has been going on for 100 years. So remember that next time you see a mummy movie and you're there with your kids and you get all scared and they can't sleep at night. Right? It all started with the kid anyway. Looking for a young boy's, young pharaoh, young boy's tomb. And now you know the rest of the story. Now you know. <laughs> Channeling Paul Harvey. Oh, man, that's good. And, you know, if you've, of course, if you've ever seen pictures, because occasionally these, these artifacts from King Tut's tomb will make it to America or small portions of them uh, on exactly. exhibits and agreements between, you know, with the Egyptian authorities and everything. And if you look at them, they're, they're unbelievable. And... Um, you have to wonder what all the other tombs that were looted would have looked like if, oh, exactly. if this small, because it was a, it wasn't a huge tomb, right. uh, nothing like a Ramses or anything like that, uh, anyone like that. And, and they found, like you how, you said, 5,000 pieces, 5,000 5, pieces. And, and they were, they were spectacular. Yep. That's, that's a, that's a good story. Well, About real quickly, I want to share some items. This is a fans applicator for makeup. You know, you put that on, you know, don't okay. hate me because I'm beautiful. But to put this on. <laughs> hey, even guys wore makeup back then. It's in the shape of a baboon. We'll just look at this. And then I was going through some artifacts. This little cup right here. You can see the little hieroglyphs on it. Can you see the hieroglyphs on there? It says, and he, in uh, hieroglyph, it says, don't touch that. <laughs> but inside, I forgot all about this. Here's this little ring. I don't know if you can see that or not. But it's a, but it's a baboon. <clears throat> so you got, your, you got your baboon ring and your baboon makeup thing. Now you're styling now. You're styling. So anyway, <laughs> one more thing. It was discovered. King Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922. I don't know how many kids have ever seen a silver dollar. And this is 1922. It's called the peace dollar. Actual silver, not made out of old rusty beer can. <laughs> and then there's an eagle on the back. But anyway, I thought a little nostalgia, 